we've been in the book of Ephesians, and um, we're going to continue in the book of Ephesians. So basically, um, as Tony and I have said before, the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians are basically telling us how amazing it is to be in Christ, all that we have in Christ, the blessings, the richness of God's love, the richness of his grace, the greatness of his power. Like it, it just, Paul literally is reminding the Ephesians and reminding us how amazing it is to be in Christ. What an amazing thing that we have as Christians. And, and he goes through some effort in both all three chapters, right? Chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three to talk about this, the depth of what we have, right? Not just listing off the gifts that we have in Christ, but the depth of love and the depth of, and the breadth of God's love, like that beautifully written Ephesians 3, 10 to 14 about that, or 14 to 17 about just that depth and width and height and and, and kind of helping us understand that it's it's one of these things that it's it's unsearchable. Like you never get to the end and going, ah, this is it. It's it's not that you don't find anything. It's that when you get to that, ah, this is it. There's more and there's more and there's more. And so really, I think his idea was to fill them and remind them to fill themselves with this huge knowledge of what they are or what they have and who they have in Christ, right? That, you know, Tony likes to use the term whose we are and who we are. And so with that in mind, he ends off chapter three in, in an interesting way. And I'm going to read this to you. This is after that long diatribe about, you know, height and width and depth and all of that. And then he goes, he ends it off by going, in verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, does that not sound like the end of a letter? <laughs> it's like, Amen. Have a great day, guys. <laughs> That's almost what it sounds like, doesn't it? But then it can, the letter continues because it doesn't end at the end of chapter three. And it's, and, it's, and it's like maybe he was writing all of that and took a break, <laughs> right? And this was like, all right, you know, I'm going to write this letter and then I'm going to take a little break and came back to it. And, and the second section or the last three chapters are really our response to what God's done. It is our, who we ought to be in light of this. And again, the, the caveat or the thing to remember is whenever we start talking about who we are ought to be as Christians and what we ought to do, our natural tendency is to start to, to even feel a little bit guilty, like, oh, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. But I think there's a reason he began with all those chapters because he wanted it, our hearts to be saturated with God's love and grace and, and what, we, what we have and who we have in Christ. I think that was his intention, at least one of his intentions was to saturate the audience or the readers with this concept that we are, we are everything in Christ. We have everything we need in Christ. And so then he goes on in verse um, one of chapter four, and he says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So he starts out the letter, or, or this section of this chapter, saying, um, and again, just a reminder for all of us 
today. They, they wouldn't, Paul wouldn't have written this as, as chapters, right? This would have been a, just a long letter. <laughs> so again, it even makes that ending more poignant because it's like, is he done? Like, why, why did he say forever and ever, amen? That's how you end up letters. But it makes that even, that, that statement about the, the, what he wanted to richly communicate before he went on to this that much more important. And then he says, as a prisoner for the Lord, again, reminding them of his situation, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle, being patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. So there are these very bold, <laughs> strong, honestly difficult things that Paul lays out, right? They're very eloquently written, but when you, when you take them and you think, okay, Paul, I want to be a great student of the word and I also want to be a great disciple to Jesus. You're asking me to be worthy of the life I've been called to, which, amen, I want to do that. I want to be a worthy servant. I want to live my life as best I can so that, you know, when it's all said and done, I will hear those words, good and faithful servant. And then he says, um, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Like, those are not small things. Humility is by far one of the most difficult things that I strive to do every day. And one of the things I fail in every day. <laughs> like, I am never completely humble. I've never had a day in my entire life, pre-Christian and post-Christian, where I've been completely humble or completely gentle. Like, so... I think what he's doing, though, that concept of being worthy of the calling is, again, painting the picture of who we ought to be, right? He's painting the picture of Jesus. That's just, this is who Jesus was. I don't think he's taking a whip and saying, this is like, if you're not completely humble today, you ought to feel bad about yourself. I don't think that's the point, because then I... I personally would be feeling bad every single day of my life. He's painting a picture of what it looks like to be worthy of that calling, right? That humility, that gentleness, that patience, that love for each other. Why? He just got done telling us how amazing it will be having Christ Jesus. We know we've been saved by grace. We know the works that we do are works God's prepared for us, but they don't perpetuate the grace. They don't continue to make the grace flow. The grace flows based on God. But that's our response to that abundance of grace and love is to strive every day to live this life worthy of the calling. And it takes humility to live the Christian life. It takes humility to obey the call of Jesus. To, to deny myself every day takes humility. I have to First of all, my day, I've got to start my day with God because I can't live, I can't truly live out the Christian life without God. Now, whether I start my day with God or not, God is always with me. That's his promise. That's his faithfulness. God's just amazing that way. When I ask God to be with me, it's because I don't feel him with me. It's not because he's not with me. When we say God be with me, it's, it's a redundancy. God is with us. We carry God with us through the Holy Spirit. God is never apart from us as children of Christ, as saved Christians. So we walk with Christ. We lay down with Christ. We get up with Christ. We, God is always with us, right? So, but I need that humility is a profound thing that is un. It's not in my nature to be. It's not in your nature to be, you know. I remember one time uh, I was helping a sister with something um, where, you know, she was humble. <laughs> and I was saying, you know, there's one way to get out of this situation. 
and it's for you to be humble. And she was like, well, but that they, and, and it's like, I was like, you're right. They absolutely, like <laughs> they, no question about it. They, everything you're saying about they is 100% true because I witness it. But you can continue to say they, 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 and stay in this conflict or you can humble out and one of you can do the right thing and perhaps be on your way to peace. That's a choice. You can make that choice or continue in the strife. You can also make that choice, but it takes that level of humility. And I remember her saying to me, it's, it's just easy for you to be humble, Melanie. And I was like, what, <laughs> what do you, what do you mean? Like, she was like, you're just a humble person. I was like, oh, wow. So either I've, I've been very like deceptive and I haven't been honest with you about who I really am. <laughs> like, I was like, no, that's, that's not true. It's simply not easy for any human being to be humble. I think some people have learned that it's better to be quick to humble than go through this journey of conflict, but easy? No, I don't think human, human nature and humility are, it's easy. But then he goes, talks about this concept of making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And again, you know, peace is one of those things when you're talking about interrelationships, it doesn't necessarily mean there is no conflict, right? Often to achieve peace, there has to be some kind of working through of something, right? Um, but but I do think I do think we we have to value peace in our relationships with each other more than we value our own thoughts and feelings. And and you you either value it or you don't. You have to value it. If you value peace, humility is what you're going to strive for in your conflict with people, and you're going to find peace. That other person may not, you may not be in a, in a, that relationship may not be one with another Christian. It may be with someone that's not a Christian and they may not even have the wherewithal to be humble <laughs> and may not accept any responsibility. You still get to find peace in that through humility because it's not about necessarily in, in those relationships reconciliation it's about you reconciling yourself to god you reconciling yourself to your lord and why do i say that look at what he ends this section off with i this section has been often called the seven um core values of christianity the seven core values of our faith and i want you to think about this i'm going to go through them keep the unity of the spirit um to the bond of peace. Why? How? One, there's one body. Two, there's one spirit, just as you were called to. Three, one hope when you were called. One Lord, four, one faith, five, one six, baptism. And in verse six, one God and Father who is um, father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So he goes, he ends this little section off by saying, how do we have this peace? How can we have, we're unified by a oneness in these core values of our Christian faith. One body. There's one body. Jesus is one body on this earth. Now, and we're a part of this one body here in Ottawa. This is our little section of that one body and it's God's and we get to be a part of it and he talks about one spirit one holy spirit binds all of us together and that one spirit there is not a ounce of division in that one spirit he is completely unified with God and completely unified with Jesus so this unity clearly comes from us and our own flesh, right? One hope. We're all called to one hope, the hope of heaven, the glorious hope that one day 
one day all of this will be done and we will see God face to face and we will worship God and we will be whatever our heavenly bodies will be. I don't know what that will be. I know it's glorious. We'll have that one hope. We all have that one, one Lord. We're actually following one person. So of course we, have, we are capable of being unified. We're not following 10 different people. I'm not following Buddha and you're not following this person and this person and this person or this guru and that guru. So all our philosophies are different. Nope, we're following one Lord, one Jesus, one Lord. That's how we can be unified, one faith. What do we believe? We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in one Holy Spirit. We believe in this journey, this discipleship. We believe in helping people to know this one God. We believe in the same thing. Our faith is one, one baptism. We all know, we all know. And I think the significance of one baptism, right, is at this particular time, that oneness was important because there were other baptisms that were preached and taught, you know, whether it was from the Jews who had ceremonial baptisms or John's baptism, you know, 25 years later, there's one baptism. When people are coming to Christ, there's one baptism. And we know the significance of that baptism. We mark that day, like we mark the day of our birth, you know, because we know that's our rebirth. We know that's the moment in time where we went from being Melanie the sinner to Melanie the saved. Like that is, I may still be a sinner, but I'm not Melanie the sinner. I'm Melanie the saved. I'm Melanie the resurrected on that June 8th, 1989. And I will never forget it. And most of us as Christians will never, we actually celebrate it. We tell each other about it because we remember that moment of our resurrected life. And one God, he ends it up by saying one God because this one God covers it all, over all, in all, through all, above all. He is this one God. We can be unified based on those things. And what I love about the scriptures is <clears throat> the scriptures simplify everything. They simplify everything. They clarify and make everything simple. And, and I say that to say, I, you know, as you guys know, I am a person who believes in that, the idea of understanding who you are as an individual, understanding your history, um, understanding how your history shapes you as an individual. For lack of a better term, the psychology of the person, like what, how did this person come to be this way? I, I value that kind of stuff. Not everybody does, and I'm fine with the, the fact that you don't value that stuff or think it's as important as I do. But one of the things I know that happens to me and in my conversations with a lot of people happens to others is when you look into those things or you do research or read books, whether it's B'nai Brown or you know any of the famous people who've written these books about understanding who you are. Often what can happen to your mind is you can shift your thinking, not completely off the scriptures, but just off center, like where some of these things take precedent over one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one hope, where it's, where I, I can begin to even counsel myself and counsel other people more with the philosophies based on psychology rather than the simplicity of the word of God. Because again, I feel like sometimes I think, and it's to my shame, I think that if I communicate the simplicities of the word of God to somebody, they're gonna think I'm not li really listening to their, who they are and listening to their plight and I'm dumbing down or I'm simplifying their tragedy or their difficulty. And as we've been doing these things every day and I'm reading different commentaries and whatever, what, I, what I'm coming to realize about the truth of God's word anew, because I know there's a time in my life where I went through this, 
but afresh. I'm learning this afresh is that the power of God's word is astounding. And many times I think what I ought to be doing with people, even as I listen and I counsel and I help, is let the word of God sit with people. Like I need to share and listen, but then let it sit. Just say, hey, I want you to just sit with this and let's talk again. Instead of me trying to get to the bottom of a situation and help this person and walk away from this interaction feeling like this whole thing is just, yes, amen, you feel good. For you. Like, no, just, you know, there's, there's value in letting someone sit and letting the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does way better than I could ever do it. Because the Spirit desires, He desires this, what we're talking about. And that's, He wasn't put in us so that we could just ignore Him and ignore that He lives. He was put in us because God wanted us to have a constant counselor, a constant reminder Right? That's what Jesus calls him, a counselor. And he's the one that Bible says convicts you of judgment and sin and what's to come. Like that's part of why he's there. He's, he helps me. He guides me. He helps me remember what are the poor gifts of the spirit or gift of the spirit. Right? So, so I love this because it's, when I read it, I think to myself, that's, it's so motivating. I want to be humble and gentle. I want to live that worthy calling. I want to be worthy of that calling. And how do I do that? How do I keep this sense of peace with myself, with my brothers and sisters? Remembering the, the core values that I believe as a Christian. Do I, do I, if I really believe this, I'm really striving and I believe this, then that's what I'm striving for, not to hang on to my hurt or my anger or my whatever, I'm striving for the, this unity based on these deep convictions that I have. And I know all of you have these deep convictions. I may not know all the other Christians out there, but I know you guys and I know you have. If I asked each one of you individually, do you believe these seven things? You would say 100%, absolutely no question about it. We all believe these things. I think the call is for us to live like we believe them, <laughs> especially when they're being tested, right? Especially when that peace is being tested. And I think we are living in a time during COVID, during these, this unrest, but just during a period, this is the 21st century, it, it, we are inundated with constant, a barrage of negativity and ugly. You know, we get to see the sin of the world 24 seven if we want to, whether in text or in vision, visually, we're, we're just, and so there's such a great need, the need for these core values to be upheld like a beacon of light, right? Just to, to shine. Um, but if you're anything like me, boy, it is, it is not easy to take up this mantle. It's not easy. But I, I just want to challenge us. You know, I was studying the Bible the other day with a, a teen, and I was doing pre-studies with her, right, just to teach us some things in Scripture. And we looked at the Scripture in um, 2 Corinthians 10 about temptation. And I said, did you know that when you are tempted, there's always an option? You don't actually ever have to give in to your temptation. And she was like, well, yeah, of course, but you know, sometimes you do. And I was like, no, no, this is, this scripture is actually very true because Jesus was tempted in every way he comes to man. She goes, no, he wasn't. I go, yeah, he was. That's what the Bible says. Every way comes to man. So there's things Jesus was tempted with that I would, I've never been tempted with. If it's every way common to man, then it's everything any man could ever have been tempted with, right? If I take that to mean what it means. Um, she, she said, wow, I never knew that. And I said, God offers you a way out. 
you have to first make the choice to resist temptation. Because it says he will offer it. You have to find that way. You have to look for the way out. And I said to her at the end of it, what do you think your week would look like if you resisted temptation? And she was like, whoa. <laughs> but then I walked away from the study going, whoa. <laughs> because I believe that scripture. I read that scripture. I was like, when was the last time I challenged myself? <laughs> like, what, what would my day, forget the week, what would my day look like if I resisted temptation? And so I want to just leave that with us. Like, with this, these verses in mind about peace and humility um, based on our core values, what would our day look like if we just made the choice, resisted temptation and made the choice to be humble in, in any situation that challenged us? What would, what would that look like? So I'm going to do that for myself today. I just want to challenge you not encourage you, challenge you <laughs> to do that. Let's take one day at a time and let's see how we do. Um, and let's even just have a discussion about it when we come back and talk about how it went and, you know, what things came up most in our lives where we felt ourselves challenged to our the ugly head of pride raise our heads. So, um, that's it for the devotional. I'm going to pray quickly, and uh, then for those who need to drop off, you can go ahead and drop off, and we can then spend a few minutes um, talking. <clears throat> Lord, we come before you this morning. First of all, God, wow, we, it feels just right <laughs> to come before you because um, what a higher call. Um, what a noble purpose you've given us to live as Christians. Um, you knew, Father, when you sent your son here to die, you knew the life that he lived, the, the path that he showed us, you knew it was exactly what we needed if we were going to make it to heaven. You knew we needed to see another human being. We needed to see flesh and blood. Um, and you knew that we would still need him, even as he's ascended to heaven. You knew that as we were praying when he wasn't on this earth, that his intercession, his, I don't even know what that would look like. I know we dumbed that down to be him explaining silly things to you, but I don't know what that intercession looks like, but I do know, Father, his blood is an intercession. His blood covers me. And any time I sin, he's interceding by the washing of his blood consistently so that I remain in your presence or you remain with me, God. And whatever ways, other ways he intercedes, I'm so grateful, so thankful this morning, so in awe of this powerful and complete plan that you had for our lives, God. You, you, there was no stone that was left unturned. There was no need in terms of the Christian faith that we would have that we you hadn't thought about. Everything in salvation is complete and perfect and amazing. God, thank you so much that um, you are patient with us. You, you demonstrate the humility. You're the one who demonstrates the peace um, and the patience. Uh, when, when really, if any of us were in your position, we would just be so like done with us, we would be impatient and um, we certainly would never maintain humility. Um, we would be holding up our perfection like a beacon. Father, thank you, thank you for that. Um, as we walk in our days and we challenge ourselves today in, to be humble in light of temptation, um, Father, through your spirit, strengthen us, show us and teach us and help us because we are willing, our, our, our spirit in us is willing, but our flesh is so weak, God, and we so desperately need the strength that comes from you. Thank you, God. Thank you for all that you do. We offer this prayer through the powerful name of Jesus and to your glory. Amen.